I joined TNS on the 1st of December and immediately set in motion a research process in which we combined survey research with panel data. So we've got a survey, that's my version of somebody asking questions and a respondent who's really interested in our questions. Um, and typically, you know, to be really boring, we would get graphs like this, that 40% of the people claim to shop at Walmart Mart or, they, or claim to use Aerial or whatever it might be. But it's in China, UK and USA. And then when we check our results, we see that 40% actually did use the brand and so on and so forth. But when we have a look at individual people, we discover that a whole bunch of people who said that they were using a particular brand actually weren't. And we have to ask the question, how is it that we still get the answer right? And the answer is because a whole lot of people who said they weren't using a brand actually were. This is what's called mutually compensating error. And it might seem like a trivial thing, except it's actually deadly, and it's, 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 it pervades our research. It pervades our research. For everybody who says they will stay at a hotel again but doesn't, there's somebody who says they will not stay there again but does. For everybody who says they will buy Volkswagen next time but doesn't, there's somebody who says they will not buy Volkswagen next time but does. And the problem with this, uh, with, this, with this issue is that the next question we try to answer is who are our users and why are they choosing our brands? And we get it wrong because we're modeling against the wrong people. It is a fundamentally important issue. And so for me, this issue of respondent level validity is, is, is one of the most important things that we need to address if we're going to close the gap. So let's then ask an important question as we voyage into what I want to say over the next minutes. What is the relationship between the answers people give us, individual people give us, to the questions we ask and what they actually do? And let's make a solemn commitment. This is, I, you know, my background is religion, so I'm going to be like, like this is like now what a priest would do. The priest would say, I invite you all to commit. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the commitment we're going to make. If we find a better way to do things, that's what we will do. We have to find a way to rebuild the ship while staying afloat in it. We can't tear things down. But actually, we have to find a way to do it to move forward, to improve things when we find a way to improve things. So let me introduce you to some of our results. And you know, this, this is only just beginning. So there's a lot more drama to come, I have to warn you. These are the sorts of questions we might ask. Awareness, this is especially in the brand world. Awareness, added awareness, whether people use the brands or not. We ask brand strength questions, satisfaction, purchase intention, recommendation, all that sort of thing. We ask brand attributes. We ask touch point measurement questions. And the question is, how well did the answers that people gave us to those questions align with reality? And the answer is, if you looked at the aggregate level, the correlations are really good. When you make a number go up, you get more spend, on average. But when you look at which people were responding, the numbers are really poor. At least they're poor in my view. There are the respondent level correlations um, and I thought what I'd do, you know, one of the things we're doing is trying to save money. I thought the really easy way to do it is just stop asking bad questions. So let's have a look at the questions that would go if we started to apply some rigor. Almost everything. Actually, it's not that bad. It's just that we can do better.